So we've covered the IDW, the Intellectual Dark Web, quite a lot on the channel. And one of the most entertaining subplots on Twitter for the last couple of months has been Travis Pangburn. Pangburn philosophy and their gradual and very public implosion. And it's finally reached a kind of inevitable ending earlier, I think yesterday or earlier today, um, where Pangburn has actually folded. So we're going to do a quick recap of the whole history of Pangburn for people who aren't aware of it and how it's been the gift that keeps on giving on Twitter for those who can't look away from car crash moments. Uh, so Pangburn, starts, Pangburn sort of obviously saw the opportunity with the kind of the big, big following of Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris and some of the other IDW members took a big leap, um, put on these big events, including obviously the, the big uh, Vancouver debates between Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson and the big London Dublin events as well that, that included, uh, the Vancouver ones included Brett Weinstein and the London ones included Douglas Murray. And fair play, they were very big um, events. It was sort of stadium gigs for intellectuals, brilliant kind of, it was certainly a, a big um, idea that they had, uh, possibly too big. And, but then from there they went out, they did some big conferences in, or announced some big conferences in Australia, Melbourne and Sydney, I think, and Auckland. And then they cancelled the Auckland one, and then for a long, but didn't, as far as I can tell, didn't refund a large number of the people who bought tickets in Auckland and didn't pay a lot of the speakers. Um, for a lot of the Australia work and then this just became this this incredible public relations disaster on Twitter because Travis Pangburn seems like the least self-aware guy on Twitter so he kept up all of these kind of all of these postings and everyone was just commenting and work, commenting why won't you pay people back when you're gonna pay people back it was just this crazy dumpster fire online probably the most yeah the most sustained negative public uh, relations disaster that i've i think i've ever seen because then he would then he was getting into public twitter discussions with people like eric weinstein sam harris trying to blame them for pulling out of his event even though it was quite clear that he still owed a lot of people money and even now so there was this, there's this conference supposed to be coming up in New York called the Day of Reflection, which is a wonderful, wonderful name, Travis, a Day of Reflection. Maybe, maybe there's a message there. Maybe your subconscious has sent you a message, a Day of Reflection. Maybe you should take one. Um, this Day of Reflection originally had a whole host of like big IDW names. One by one, they pulled out and it got poorer and poorer. They were initially charging $500 for the tickets. So a lot of irate people wanting their money back because they, they paid to see people who were no longer gonna be part of it. Jordan Peterson pulled out, Sam Harris pulled out. Eventually, pretty much everyone pulled out. Now it's been canceled. And as it's been canceled, Travis Pangburn has now officially folded Pangburn philosophy. And even the statement they released yesterday pretty much blamed the speakers for the events that have unfolded. It's, it's pretty astonishing. Ali, you used, you used to work in marketing. Yeah, well, I used to work in marketing and I also used to work in one of the, if not the best events agency in the world, Jack Morton Worldwide. So I've been watching this with, uh, yeah, maybe a bit of a glee, not so much for the people who lost their money, that really sucks and I feel for them, but mainly just, it is car crash TV. It's, it is like watching a slow car crash on Twitter. So, yeah, and, I don't quite know where to begin. I mean, I think this whole collapse is, um, and also his attitude and his kind of blaming, it, it, for a long time it's been the, the behavior of a man who's in panic mode because he knows he's screwed. And so it's, it's almost had this feeling for me of like inevitability. I mean, also just so unprofessional the, the way he's done it. You just never do that, just having these public spats and just this lack of personal responsibility and integrity. So th th there's all of that. My thinking on where he went wrong strategically is 
A, um, we know from behind the scenes sources that his marketing strategy was effectively, hey guys, if you're speaking, tweet it out. And I, I think there maybe were a little bit of digital marketing, but not much more. Whereas with people of that profile, could have done radio interviews, could have done maybe not billboards necessarily, but there, there are a lot of other marketing channels you could go to with that. Um, it wouldn't be difficult. So there was that. And then also just uh, apparently the production values were quite low. Um, it was kind of a stage, some chairs. And uh, when you're putting on an event of that scale and that kind of um, with that level of people on stage, if we've been doing it at Jack Morton, for example, a lot more would have gone into the actual production. You would have, you know, we would have made it a, you know, an experience uh, in a different way than it, it sounds like he did. And the other thing as well, obviously I used to be a journalist, public relations battle, like 101 is, a, is admit your mistakes. It's, and what's fascinating as well is that because it, we've seen on Twitter and Facebook and everywhere else, he's been getting that kind of feedback from people every time he's tweeted. People have just been saying, look man, just fess up, say you, say you made a mistake, pay the money back and take your lessons. And that's what's really infuriated people is that he's failed on every count to accept responsibility for what he's done and accept that, just to, just to apologize. And that in, in the internet age in particular, when there's kind of full accountability and there's nowhere to hide, that's the one thing I just don't see how you get, there's no alternative to, to that. Yeah. And, and my theory, it's just a theory on why, partly why he did that, I don't know him as a person, so it could be an aspect of his personality, but I do know the venues that he was doing it. And I've been to those venues, I've actually met the, you know, the venue team at places like the O2, and it is, they're not cheap. And also when you're doing a, an event in a foreign country, which for him a lot of them were, you have to work with foreign suppliers and that is always a tricky thing because you don't know, generally you don't know, am I getting the best price? A big part of putting on an event is getting the best prices from your suppliers. And I can just envisage that he really lost, I mean, that he was losing a lot more money than he was making in, in certain situations. You know, things just add up massively and, and venues like the O2 are huge and they're very expensive. So point being, what I think happened is that people were like, hey, just fess up, give the money back. I think he was like, I don't have it. So what it feels like as well is that he brought a very 20th century extraction model to a 21st century phenomenon. The thing about Jordan Peterson in particular, but also the intellectual dark web, is it's an emergent phenomenon. And it's an emergent phenomenon out of the internet age. And in the internet age, there are certain expectations about the way that things should be done. Transparency being absolutely key, and there's been very little transparency. What's been interesting as well, after all of this has happened, Eric Weinstein has been spending all of his breaks and all of his time talking to people on Twitter, getting, gathering their details, potentially for a class action suit, who knows, but at least to put pressure on Pangburn to refund people. Like the IDW members realize what a kind of public relations disaster this is because it reflects on them. Um, a lot of the people who bought tickets don't necessarily know that it's, it's not their responsibility. And the point about this as well, I think there was a, this was a massive missed opportunity. If I look back to the Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris events, those had the potential to be cultural touchstone moments. And the way to do that, I think, would have been to live stream them, would have been to create a buzz around them. There's a huge audience of, of people who followed Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris. And I think there was a real sense of this extractive model that Travis was bringing. So I'm going to film them, but I'm going to release them to patrons only. It's going to take a long time for me to do that. And just trying to extract all the value out of it. The audience that have built up around Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson all have come there because their, their content was free. Most of their content was put out for free. And then to impose this model on it that tries to extract just felt really wrong, mm. felt exploitative, felt like it was, it was breaking an unspoken contract with both Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson's audience. And I think both of them actually had quite a bit of pushback from their own audience because of that as well. The way to do it, I think, and I know you agree, and we've spoken with a few other people about this, was to have live streamed them, make them a cultural moment that everyone, everyone's eyes are on. 
If you've got enough people watching, there's other ways, there's YouTube Super Chat, there's other ways that you can monetize that. Maybe it's, it's free while you watch it, then to watch it afterwards you have to pay. But there was a chance to get the eyes of the world onto this, onto this debate. And by the time the, the recordings came out, especially the Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson, I didn't even watch them. I was, I was kind of, I would have definitely watched all the debates live, but I didn't watch them um, when they'd been released because the, the moment had gone. You know, as you're saying that, another thing comes up as, as just this kind of missed opportunity to build community within all the different people who are fans of or interested in the IDW. Because there is this kind of, everything became quite insular with that model as well. It's like you go to the event and then months later you get the content if you paid for it. That, there's a huge groundswell of people who want to meet each other and talk about this and introduce it to their friends and be able to have that cultural moment where they can be like, hey, this, you know, people have heard about it in the mainstream. Again, the, the part of its tactics, part of it is just the attitude of like, um, not using this broadcast model, but using this ground up model. And that's, that makes me almost sad thinking about it because I know how much energy is there. Yeah, because in the events that we've done, giving people the, the chance to, to talk about some of these ideas, there's a real sense of relief. People are, people are desperate to have free spaces to express things that maybe they don't feel able to express at work or they don't feel able to express in their groups of friends. And that's, that's what's fueling the IDW phenomenon. So how do you take the conversations that are being had in public by the high profile figures and give the opportunity for people to join in that conversation? Yeah, and I was just say, just to add to that, it's, it's a big part of the IDW is how to have conversations in public. And that urge, A, there's the urge of just like, God, I just want to be able to express myself. Um, but we all want to know how to have conversations in public. We all want to practice having conversations in public. So really it should be a, um, I don't know if democratic is the right word, but a much more of a back and forth. And there's so much potential in that, I think. So I think what we're saying is that this, this is an emergent conversation. The IDW is part of it, but it's all facilitated by the internet. It's emerging naturally, and it needs to be treated like an emergent phenomenon. I think live streaming is, as we've talked about, helping other people to, to join. There's a huge amount of goodwill as well. Like there's a lot of people, since we've been starting doing what we've done, We've had a lot of people offer their help to us in kind of web design and graphic design and stuff like that, which has been fantastic, really helpful. I think when people recognize what the people in the IDW are trying to do, the kind of conversations they're trying to have, and the stakes, the fact that these are the essential conversations that need to be had right now, there's a huge amount of goodwill and a huge amount of desire to help. And then I think you're, if you can tap into that, tap into making it a cultural moment, engaging people, then you've got a chance of really shifting the culture. And I think it obviously needs a curation strategy that recognises the moment that we're in. And I think it's fair to say that Pangburn philosophy wasn't the right one. There's a phrase that we have in England called shitting the bed. Hangburn shat the bed. <laughs>